Hello guys and welcome back to Engineering Hack, where we try to solve engineering problems in a way that's hopefully easy to understand. Today we're looking at the NTU method used to determine the size of heat exchangers or to figure out what's the actual heat a heat exchanger is capable of, um, well, exchanging. In this case here, we are given already the setup of the system. So this is a, a ratio, sorry, a chart that relates the effectiveness in the NTU. Generally, what we need to do is actually find out whether the chart we're looking at is effectively the one that we need to use. So that in this case here, we're already given only one single chart, so that's one step less for us to do. Problem statement reads, a hot exhaust gas which enters a fin tube cross-flow heat exchanger at 350 degrees Celsius and leaves at 150 degrees Celsius is used to heat pressurize water at a flow of 2 kilograms per second from 30 to 135 degrees Celsius. Assuming that specific heat of water is constant and equal to 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, the overall heat transfer coefficient based on the gas side surface is U equals 200. And the correlation between the effectiveness and NTU is shown in figure one. We are to determine the required gas side surface area using the NTU method. So if you recall, the NTU method, as is shown here on the bottom of this chart, relates the number of transfer units to the area, surface area of the heat exchanger, the overall heat transfer coefficient and the minimum heat capacity or heat capacity rate. Okay, so in this problem, what we're looking for is actually the surface area. So what we want to do is we just want to flip this around. And if you want to find a surface area for this heat exchanger, you just need to multiply the NTU by the minimum heat capacity rate and divide that by the overall heat transfer coefficient. Now, in this case here, I'm going to use this fancy C here for the capacitor rate so that we don't confuse it with the specific heat, which is the C sub P we've been using. Okay, so what is my... What is my game plan here? My game plan is, let's find out what is the effectiveness of the system. With the effectiveness and the ratio between the heat capacities, I can find out my NTU. With my NTU, I can find out my area. So first things first, let's start with drawing our diagram, simple diagram for this situation here. We have hot gas flowing in one direction, and we have cold water flowing in another one. Does it matter the direction? It does not matter in the case of the NTU. And as a matter of fact, what's happening here is that it's parallel flow. Right, so the hot fluid is coming on on one direction and the cold fluid is coming on perpendicular to it. So, you know, this drawing here is not really representative of what's happening. It's more for us to organize our thoughts. Now, the hot gas is being uh, cooled down from 350 Celsius down all the way to 150 degrees Celsius. Whilst the uh, cold water is being heated from 30 all the way to 135 degrees Celsius. Under those circumstances, what we can put down on this right-hand side here is also the mass flow rate of the cold and the hot. We know the cold one to be 2 kilograms per second. And we know the specific heat of the cold to be the one of water. So that's 4. Point, what, did it, what did it give us? 4.8. 4. So that's specific heat for water is 4.18 kilojoules per kilograms per Kelvin. So same thing as 4180, 4180 joules per kilograms per Kelvin. So let's put down here in the same unit we used to. 4180, oops, joules per kilograms per Kelvin. What about the mass flow rate of the um, hot? We don't know this, and we don't know the specific heat for the hot gas as well. All right, so from this point onwards, what can we do? We can do a mass balance. We can do a mass balance between these two because we are sure that energy is flowing from hot to cold, so like so, right? So this is our Q. And we know that if we can obey the first law of thermodynamics, and we can, then that the energy being released by the hot is the same as the energy being absorbed by the cold. In this case here, this is broken down further into the mass flow rate of the hot times the specific heat of the hot times the delta T of the hot which has to be equal to the mass flow rate of the cold, the specific heat of the cold, and the delta T of the cold. Note that we have 
these delta twos. We have this specific heat, and we have the mass flow rate of the cold, but we don't have these guys here. Thankfully, we're not interested in those two, but we're interested in the multiplication of them, right? Because we know that these two guys combined is precisely the heat capacity, right? So this is C, big C, or fancy C. Okay, so that means we can find fancy C, but relating to things that we do know. So let me rewrite this. So that means that the heat capacity well, times the difference in temperature for the hot, which is 350 minus 150. This would be equal to my 2 kilograms per second times my 41, 4180 times my difference in temperature for the hot water, 135, 135 minus 30. Unit-wise, well, here we have degrees Celsius or Kelvin, difference in temperature, same thing here. So these two units are going to cancel each other out. And the unit for our heat capacity is just going to be the unit of this multiplication here, right? So that's going to be the kilograms per second times the joules per kilograms per second. And that leaves us with watts per Kelvin, sorry, difference every watts per Kelvin, right? And that's the unit for the heat capacity. So this guy here, so this means that C, heat capacity C equals 4389, 4389, and that is watts per difference in temperature. Cool, so now that I know that, I can go back here and I can actually relate the two heat capacities. I know one of them will be the 4389 that we just found, and the other one, this one here, will be just the multiplication of these two values here, right? So the 41 times two, so roughly 82. And indeed, we get 8360, right? 8360. Both of which are in the same unit, watts per difference of temperature in Kelvin or in Celsius. Now that we have these two, we can determine which is which. And whichever is smaller will be my min, and whichever is greater will be my max. Simple as that. Okay, so from now on, what we can do is we can find what is the effectiveness of our, of our heat exchanger, because now we can relate what will be the maximum theoretical um, Heat that it could be exchanged in this the rate that could be exchanged, and we know that that's going to be related to the maximum delta T in this system. So between the inlet of the hot and the inlet of the cold, and the C uh, minimum heat capacity, right? So let's explore that further. We know that the effectiveness of a given heat exchanger will be how much energy is actually being exchanged divided by what's the maximum theoretical I can possibly exchange. The actual one, I can choose whether I want to use, you know, the one for the hot or the one for the cold. I'm going to be smart and choose the one for the hot because I know that's going to be my minimum, right, my capacity minimum. So again, I'm going to do this for here, the hot, which again is the same as the key for the cold. And that is going to allow me to do um, 4389 times the difference for the hot, which is 350 minus 150, divided by the maximum theoretical to C min, right? C min, which happens to be exactly this one here. That's why I chose it. 4389. And then the maximum theoretical, that's going to be my hot in 350 minus my cold in 30. So 350 minus 30. So pretty much what this does is that eliminates one part of the math, and we're just left with the ratio between the difference in temperatures. And this gives us, uh, let's just be really clear about this. This is, you know, inlet of the hot, and this is the inlet of the cold. And this ratio gives me about 62.5, not about, exactly, actually. And, and this is the effectiveness, right? So 6, 0.625 or 62.5%. What else do I need? I need the, the ratio between C min and C max, and that's very straightforward. We already have pretty much the thing done here. So if I want to know what is the ratio between them, all I need to do is divide C min by C max, divide this by this, units obviously go away, and I'm left with, what did I get there, 0.525. And no units because the units obviously get canceled out. Okay, so these are the two parameters that I needed to be able to find my NTU. So the idea now is that I have my effectiveness, and I have the ratio between the two. Uh, heat capacities, that means I can now find what is my NTU, my number of transfer units. With that, I can relate the NTU 
my minimum heat capacity that I already know and my overall heat, tra heat transfer coefficient that I also know. Right, so that means that all we need to do is read off the graph. My six, if this is my 60 and this is my 80, this is going to be my 70. So right in the middle, that's going to be my 65. So it's probably going to be somewhere around here. That's going to be the value I'm looking for. We're better off doing this on a image editing software than you are doing on paper like I am. Um, and then the other value we have is 5 to 5, right? So 5 to 5 is going to fall between 0.5 and 0.75. So it's going to fall somewhere between this guy and this guy here. Obviously way closer than 0.5, so let's say around here. If I took this halfway over here, that would be yeah, no, definitely closer to 0.5, right? 0.5 to 5, that's definitely closer to 2.5. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a line coming down from here. And that's going to give me my NTU. So the number of transfer units I have, again, doing some eyeballing here, this is 1.5. Um, so that's probably 1.3, right? So right in the middle here will be 1.25, so probably 1.3 is a good reading. So from my graph, I determined that my NTU is about 1.3, so I have 1.3 transfer units, and now I can finally find my surface area. 1.3 times my C min, which is 43.89 on the right hand corner there. 43.89, and my overall heat transfer, heat transfer coefficient was given from the start, and that was 200. And so that gives me that my surface area has to be about 28.5. And that is meters squared, but let's just make sure that is indeed meters squared. There's no units for the number of transfer units, so that's just dimensionless. Then we know our heat capacity will be watts per difference in temperature. And at the bottom there we have overall heat transfer coefficient, which is given in watts per meter squared for difference in temperature. So indeed, this goes away, these guys go away, and we're left with meters squared, which is unit for area. So this is our answer right here. Okay, so hopefully you can appreciate that this method is quite powerful. Note that we didn't have everything we needed from the uh, fluids, from the fluid side, but even though we didn't have that, we can still calculate the size that we would require from this heat exchanger, the, you know, the surface area that would be required on the gas side surface. The other thing to be aware of that, even if you didn't have the full, you know, the full range of temperatures, if you just have the inlet and the outlet, as long as you know your specific heat in your mass flow rate, which are generally things that you do know when you're building a heat exchanger, um, you can still solve this uh, using the NTU method. But it's a quite powerful method we want to be aware of. If you guys have any questions, as per usual, just let me know. If not, we'll talk soon.